morning everybody today I thought I would talk about what to sort of do when your five-year-old brings you this beautifully written piece of paper that they've spent you know all this time on and you're like oh no what am I gonna do they're writing and they're reading and then so I want to sort of because I know I've talked about this before but I wanted to talk about it a little bit more in depth and sort of talk about what's okay to do and what's not okay to do and and how you navigate that. <clears throat> so first of all, let's stop. Let's start by saying um, a child that naturally comes to reading and writing, um, that means they just picked up a book and started reading. That doesn't mean you said, oh, well, I'll just go get 100 easy lessons to read from the library. That's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Um, we're talking about children that just decide, hey, I'm cracking this code, and they're five. And, and that happens. That happens. You know, um, my oldest was reading super early and, um, and you know, I, kids, that happens. Um, but that's not generally an invitation in Waldorf terms. It's not an invitation to go, well, let's speed through and let's get busy and let's start first grade. And it, that's not what that means because we have to remember with Waldorf, we're talking about age appropriate material at the right time. We're also talking about, you know, Waldorf sort of gets a weird bad rap about um, delayed academics. And it's not really even about that. So it's, um, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, well, Waldorf, those kids, they don't learn to read until they're in third grade. And I go, whoa, back at the truck. Actually, that's not necessarily true. In the school model, I think they probably are learning to read a little bit later than they do at home, only because you've got a big classroom full of kids. And at home, it's you and your child one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I don't, I'm not really going to talk about first grade reading because we've done videos on that. What I'm talking about is sort of how do you support a child that is, um, that is reading and writing and, and you're nowhere near first grade because that happens. So, um, you know, like my five-year-old, she will be six in April. And um, the other day, and, and she does this often, she sat for a good 40 minutes and copied, big long copy piece, and it was right, like often she's writing them backwards and I don't fuss, I don't fuss because it all sorts itself out. And she brought it to me, she was super proud. Now, <clears throat> as a mom, you don't go, dang it, you did that? You, you smile and you go, that's beautiful work. And you don't say, show me some more. <laughs> you don't do that. You just, you support them and you say, that's beautiful work. And, and you sort of, because they spent time on it and to them, because these letters are still, like, they're super archaic to them. They're not, you know, they, especially the English, like, the modern language is not pictorial. It's, it's very, very much, um, you know, abstract. So to them, it's just, they're just drawing pictures. In their head, they're not making connections yet, generally. They see us writing, and so they want us to be proud of them. So they're writing, and they're copying us, and, and they're doing the things that they think that big people do. And, and so... You know, they see, if, especially like in our house, we've got five kids, so um, our younger ones are always seeing somebody else do um, do copy work or writing their main lessons or something like that. They see me write lists, and so they want to do it. That's why if you're on your phone a lot doing this, they want to do this. It, that's what the attraction is. That's It's because they're in a very imitative state. So if that's all that is. That is all those you know, those handwritten notes are. And they're having this like feeling of accomplishment. And that's okay. Because they're really in this this space of it's it's steps to get to first grade. So it's natural for them to be sort of sorting out what letters are. Now like so right so like I have this necklace and it says it says O B for Ocean Beach, which is where we live. I'm sort of in love with where we live. So Soraya still call. She'll she'll say, um, "Tell me about those numbers on your necklace." She doesn't know that there's a difference between numbers and letters. She's five, and I don't correct her. And I just say, I don't say those are number. Those aren't numbers. I just say this one is an O and this one is a B, and that's all I say. And actually, this one is a peace sign, so that's what she knows this one as. So um, really and truly, we give them. We tend to give them way too much information. And so I've been at this a long time. And so I think that sharing with you what's appropriate to give um, would be a good thing. It would be especially for those of you that are this is your first child and you've sort of decided, well, I'm going to be on this Waldorf track. And, and oh, no, my kid's starting to read. It's okay. 
all of the stuff that sort of happens before you start first grade is really pre-reading stuff and it's okay so it's okay for them to be writing it's definitely not something you want them to be doing all day you definitely want to um you definitely want to sort of go this is great I'm glad you had fun with that let's go outside and play now and sort of balance that out and I'm going to say that's especially important if you've got one that's decoded reading if you've got one that's decoded reading and all they're wanting to do is sit in front of a book you got to get them outside you got to get them like and, and that's not to say um, you're not going to allow them to read it just means that you're just want to balance that because one of the things that I know now keep in mind my oldest was uh, is also on the spectrum but one of the things that was very apparent was because he was so in his head he was not in his body so we really want to be very careful about them being so much in their head they see us be so much in our head and and so this should be a lesson for you to sort of get out of your head a lot um, so we're going to be encouraging doing things with your hands a couple of weeks ago on handwork for preschoolers so that's incredibly important and valuable to be doing when they're sort of sorting out these new pre-reading and pre-writing skills um, and definitely lots of big movement big movement so you're running and jumping so we are in Southern California and we have this crazy amount of rain right now it's sort of driving me crazy I know we really need it but I'm this happy sanguine choleric person who really needs the sunshine so <laughs> when the sun's on I'm like yay but um, my five-year-old really needs to stomp in puddles it's because I need to be out there with her she's not gonna get all of the full body movement by herself and I really can't stand the rain so I have to figure out a way to make the rain okay for me so for me it was buying a cute pair of $50 rain boots that have bumblebees on them and um, and I got myself a really cheap $8 rain poncho so I'm gonna be out there with her I'm gonna bundle all up so I'm not cold and bundle her all up and we're gonna be out there in the rain stomping because she's got unicorn rain boots and a unicorn raincoat so she's already she's already out there stomping so really I want you to think about big movements stomping in puddles running um, especially if you're having a hard time with them sleep wise um, and and they are sort of doing this in their head thing um, and they're the, of this age group especially I want you to go you know what this is an invitation for me to get out there with them so last night after dinner 630 way too early for us to like a good 30 45 minutes too early for us to sort of scooch them into bed um, but Soraya's already in her PJs and I said put on your shoes going for a walk so we went for this walk and it was and it was big big body movement and I would say can you run from here to the the stop sign and then wait for me and so we, we do a lot of that a lot of like sprinting kind of stuff and we came home and I read their little chapter in the book that we're reading and she went right to sleep and so that's what you want you really want them to be like really worn out and and you know I was tired I could have been like you know what I just want to sit in this chair and knit well can't y'all just do something quiet no that's not gonna get her to sleep because well when we lived on Hoth um, or southeastern Idaho because um, <laughs> that's what it felt like so we lived in Sugar City which is just um, it's just down from the Tetons and it was very cold there in January very very cold I bundled them up they had wool unders then they had another layer and then they had another layer and then they had a coat hats and they were out in the snow digging snow caves um, you know we had big boys and, and and little kids at the same time so they were digging snow caves and they were building snowmen and and doing all of these things that they can do in the frozen tundra and and really having a good time and using a lot of full-bodied motion and full-bodied movement so the winter time for us when we lived there actually was just as easy to put them to bed as the summer was because they they were out there in it for hours on end and so if you're in a spot where it's really cold and I know cold I mean um, in in southeast Idaho the entire month of January is less than freezing and like right now it's like in the negatives we still spent some time outside every day and and the reason why you can utilize your body and it still makes you exhausted even if you're only out there for 10 minutes is because your body's having to work to stay warm and so you're getting you're getting work in so just make sure that you're spending some time out there and really utilizing the um, you know the, the the gift that you sort of have of nature so if you're in a spot that's really rainy like I said get rain gear you know everybody in our house just about I'm like the last one to get rain gear because I'm, I'm like I'm not going out there but now I am because I know she needs it I know she needs it and I've resisted thinking that 
we moved to San Diego because there's 300 days of sunshine, and I swear, all 65 days that are rain are right now, um, and and we've not had that before in the last few years that we've been here. So, got my rain gear because I'm getting out there with her. I can't wait for for everybody else to do it, and I can't wait for there to be time when um, I'm going to feel okay with it. So I've got the rain gear. So you've got to you've got to be behind sort of doing that big full bodied motion and full bodied movement. So that I think is a huge component of this whole like learning to read and write thing early. So if you've got them really busy, then you're balancing that out. So if you've got um, if you've got a child, and this happens to me a lot, I get a lot of emails from moms that say, but my five year old is begging to read, begging, and I feel so terrible because my mother in law just doesn't understand why I won't just teach her to read. And so you got to back that up because again, there are so many things that go into reading, so many things that go into this this literacy thing, and and one of the things that I notice about a lot of kids from a public school or even mainstream homeschool setting versus what I see with Waldorf kids is they may be reading early over here but fluency of reading reading comprehension all of those things seem to come easier to kids with the Waldorf model and why is that well a lot of it is because we're we take our time and we recall after it's been after they've slept on a story we recall and I do that no matter what it is that we're doing from the time that they're really little. I go, you remember that story we, we did yesterday? Talk to me about that story. It was a good story. Was it about a frog? Oh, you're right. It was about a turtle. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I start asking those questions when they are like really little. And, and we start going through and just sort of doing this recall thing. All of those pieces are reading literacy. All of them. So... Like the stories that we do in kindergarten, the next day we recall and we'll draw about it or we'll act it out. Like kids are enjoying the um, chapter book by Thornton Burgess about the seashore. And because we live three blocks from the beach and the tide pools are something that we're at all the time. And I wanted a way to be able to bring it to them without it being too heady. So I wanted them to be like, oh, that's a hermit crab. Let's go, let's go find one. And, um, and so his book is really good for doing that. It's really good for bringing science to kids in a very story-like way. And it doesn't put them too much in their head. We don't spend my, my 10 year old spending time, like doing a little bit of classification, but my five year old's just having a really good time looking at animals and, um, see animals in, in the tide pools when we go and she'll go, oh, that's in the Danny Meadow Mouse book. And she gets really excited about that. So that's how you sort of bridge that gap about academic science versus storytelling science. Um, use books like that. Thornton Burgess is an amazing storyteller and he has a lot of books about animals. Some of them seaside. I was really excited about those just because that's where we live. But he's got like the grade two curriculum is full of Thornton Burgess stories, but they're also super appropriate for the younger set. Super appropriate. So like I can remember when Sam was Soraya's age and Ellie was reading the Thornton Burgess stories to Sam. Um, during the day, like as her reading practice, because they're, they're simple, sweet stories. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, all of that stuff is like, that's on your road to reading. So that's what I told my kids. I know you want to read, but you know, we're doing all of these things to get you ready for the actual reading part. And if we skip these things, then reading won't be as much fun. So we're going to do all of these things first. And then when we're in first grade, then we'll do the letters. So I also do, um, we do some, some flute stuff in, um, in the kindergarten years, not a ton, um, like one note stuff. So we, we were fortunate enough to get, um, some, a used, uh, nice flute and we have, we have a couple of new ones. So my, my older child and I have a, the new one and, and we gave the, the five-year-old this great one. It's the same flute, but it was used, um, on the Waldorf tag sale for like, half the money so keep your eyes out for things like that and she can go around and she can play one note because her fingers are big enough to hold that bottom hole and one of the top holes and so so we do things like that just one note and we might sing a song about that one note so all of those pieces are reading literacy my oldest daughter when she was five she was also in the please she's begging me to learn to read she had my ex-husband up her grill and she had her bigger brothers that were doing all this school stuff, she really wanted to learn to read. So we learned, um, she taught herself to read music. 
and and that just came from us doing one note at a time and then her wanting to know what this sound means on the paper and um, when so when she was six six or so I I helped her correlate the sounds to the paper which is something that they usually don't do until about third grade but we're at home we can do things a little bit differently um, because we're doing that one-on-one -on -one and we're keeping it very lively and we are stepping back and not pushing so again, if, you're, if your child is begging to read or, or you're like all excited because you went to get 100 easy lessons to read, just back up because that's not them unfolding. Them unfolding is them decoding it on them, their own or them writing and having a good time writing. Let them have fun with it. Don't, don't try to rush with the, um, don't try to rush with, with early stuff. So let's see, I'm going to answer a question here. My six and a half year old is totally wanting to read. Well, your six and a half year old is, is just about on the cusp of getting ready to read. So if you are, um, are you doing first grade, Bridget? Um, or are you still um, finishing up kindergarten? Um, you can tell me or you can tell me, I'll just answer sort of in general. If you're a six and a half year old and you're doing first grade and your guys are about to, my guess is you're still doing kindergarten. So um, I sort of, there's sort of a gray area in there. That's going to happen. So I really wish that everybody would stop having babies in April and May. <laughs> but that's myself there too because I have an April baby. So um, April and May are really, really, really hard months as far as like um, getting them properly placed. Because really, if for placement, they really need to be seven or almost seven for first grade. And if you're having a baby, that if you're doing first grade and your child is not seven until April or May, then you are missing the entire school year and you're going to be off the whole way. Now, I know that there are other Waldorf people that are going to say, oh no, you're fine. And, and you know what? Read Steiner. <laughs> Steiner is really pretty like pointed about it. And I will tell you, I tried to push, push, push my, um, my oldest because I was new to Waldorf. I mean, I wasn't new to Waldorf, but I thought, well, I know, I know my kid better than anybody else. I'm just going to push. And this, so this was a lot of years ago, um, you know, before I was doing this sort of thing. And I had the biggest aha moment when I, when, when he, I was pushing and he was then crying <laughs> and, and like not enjoying and I wasn't enjoying and we were at, at odds and, and he was not ready. So I backed off and we spent a lot more time playing. So really what I would, would um, suggest is if you've got a child that is, has got that April, May thing, then maybe start music or start on your birthday. You know, when you're, if you are committed to homeschooling, if you're committed to homeschooling, you really could start whenever you want. And, and so a lot of parents will do a half year. So they'll do, um, they will do kindergarten until December and then pick up first grade from December um, to May. And so that's entirely appropriate. So I have um, my last two that are that are getting ready or that are you know going through. Um, Sam has a June birthday, and so he started first grade when he was seven and three months. Soraya is an April birthday, but she's also a preemie, so she will start first grade when she's seven and four months, five months, and and I feel pretty confident about that. She may be reading by then, and that's okay. But she still needs that time of simple stuff of running, of playing before she'll be re really ready to do seat work. And it may be that we'll get to December before she turns seven and I'll be feeling like, you know, it's okay for us to start now. And maybe we will. It's kind of hard to tell. Cause I think when, when somebody emails me when their child is five and asks me all these questions, I'm like, really? I can't answer that right now. Sorry, there's a garbage truck right outside my office window. <laughs> um, so it's kind of loud. But, um... I would say don't make those decisions until you're there. If you've got a child that's, um, you know, that's got an April and May birthday and you're in January, February and you're feeling like they're ready, then start. But that means you got to be consistent, especially, uh, actually all the way through. You really got to be consistent. So now people say to me, well, what's going to happen then if I decide or if the horrible thing happens, they have to go to first school or they have to go to public school and I go, nothing. Because when they get to public school, they're going to, place them based on something totally different and and you're gonna have to be okay with that because obviously you're not like 
rushing to push them into public school. It will sort itself out. And and to think that it that won't sort itself out is really stressing yourself out for things that you don't need to stress yourself out about. So um, really and truly just relax. So somebody, let's see, Jody says, my daughter is six and we're doing first grade, but she gets super bored if she does things she already knows, so we move at her pace. So um, my question when people say that to me is, well, first grade is going to be boring to them. It's not going to be boring. Here's why. And, and this is the question that I ask moms. Are you painting wet on wet watercolor? Are you drawing with block crayons and teaching those lessons? Are you teaching modeling? Are you teaching music? Are you moving your body? Are you practicing reading every day? Are you doing all of those things? Because if you're not doing all of those things, then there's no way you can talk about them being bored or them not being ready or them or them being over ready or all of those things. Because those are all pieces. First grade is much more than just reading. First grade is all of those other things. So if you're not doing like teaching instruction, then you're really not doing everything that you can be doing to fulfill first grade. So really sort of step back and look at that and decide, hey, maybe there's some things here I can pick up. Because, um, and I also tell my kids, there's no boredom. It's just called, you're going to really work to make this picture better and, and really work on let's go paint or let's do some modeling. Um, we haven't played the flute yet. How are you at handwork? You know, there's so many pieces that go into the curriculum that a properly placed child is not going to be bored. And, and, and when you get pushed back, often it's a temperament thing. So you have to sort of step back and, and, and look at the temperaments, your own and where you're coming from, as well as theirs. And um, one of the beauties of waiting for first grade until they're closer to seven is you don't have this going on that happens with the six year change. And, um, and so I really like to let that sort itself out in kindergarten. <laughs> and then you're really ready. That's sort of like this rite of passage and ready to go. So um, I really see when you're working um, the curriculum at home, I really see children that are in first grade. They're, if you're working our curriculum, they're probably about ready to read now for first grade because you've got through almost all the letter introductions, I think by now, if I'm remembering right, and you're really working on, on reading. And then you're working on that every single day. And, and even beyond when they're reading on their own, you're doing reading practice with them every single day. Um, let's see, we did it and he did it. Would, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm reading, sorry, I'm reading comments here. I would just allow them to decode and allow them to really, um, explore on their own. Two and a half is so, so young, you know, and, and I, I, I am really careful. So, you know, one of the things that my husband said to me, because my, father-in-law um, has dyslexia so he had my husband at like four and five like at the table because he was really really like nervous about my my husband having dyslexia and guess what is too young to really tell because they're still flipping their letters because that's what they do they're 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 not super you know into their body yet as far as it's time to be ready so when when we talk about Steiner and and, and academics you really got to take it to heart. You really don't want to push anything, anything that is overly academic until they're ready. And, and I know you think they're ready. You go, but this is my kid. I, I think I know they're ready. So I say, step back, pray and meditate about it. Get a consult if you need it. Um, look at all of the pieces. Have you done everything you can possibly do in kindergarten? Did you start introducing some music? How, are they finger knitting, hand knitting, spool knitting, doing lacing cards, doing some, are they doing all of those other pieces? Are you getting enough movement? Um, you know, and really, really working in there. And I really think you, you really have to, if you're sold on this path and you're sold on what you see from Waldorf kids, and you're sold on, on the sort of the trajectory that goes like the, the, the whole deal, then you gotta step back and trust. And you have to be willing to trust. And I know that's a really hard thing for a lot of moms. They're like, well, yeah, I sort of might be kind of, and I go read Steiner, because that will help. That will help a lot. It will help you sort of understand. So I would suggest Kingdom of Childhood. I would suggest study of man. There's a lot. There's a lot. And, and there's a great book um, by Roberto Trostley called Rhythms of Learning. And um, there's a couple of book studies going on about that right now. So Rhythms of Learning is a really good one because it helps you sort of understand the whys behind the house. 
And I really think it's important to just sort of step back because one of the things you want to be really careful about, and a lot of moms get really defensive about this, and so I'm just going to be really open about it because I've watched my own children, is you want to be really careful that when, because if you've got them in their head too early, you're stunting something else. And, and you know, I remember reading that thinking, yeah, all right. But then, you know, it sort of builds when somebody else says it. I remember having a Lele Leche League leader say to me, you never do something unless it's at the expense of something else. And I remember thinking, that sounds vaguely familiar. <laughs> and, and putting those things together. And she had nothing to do with Steiner. But really and truly, when I was doing the, in the act of like pushing my son, he was suffering in other ways. His, um, his movement was all crazy. He was not, his coordination wasn't good. My, my son that was running and my other son that was running and playing and jumping in puddles and doing all those things, he was riding a bike. But my oldest kid couldn't ride a bike. So there are things that are suffering. So you want to be very careful. So somebody says, my five and a half year old is already reading. We are doing kidney. She is figure knitting. Perhaps we need more movement because she does a lot of, does get a lot of outside movement. She reads a lot when I'm nursing the baby. And I think that's okay. So it's also about, mom say to me, so what do I get this kid to read? I, the, my child is five and they want to read The Hobbit. And I go, nah, -uh. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> it's okay that they're reading. So continue to get books at, um, continue to get books at the library that are picture books and have them read picture books to you. Age appropriate content. The hard thing is when you've got a four or five year old that's reading chapter books, there's not a lot of chapter books that are appropriate for them to read yet, but they can really truly understand. And that's what you want to stick with. You don't want to put them in their head even more where they're trying to figure out what's going on in The Hobbit. Uh-uh. You want to slow that back and simple, easy stuff. So I would continue with, you know, authors that you love and, and that are picture book authors. And I would go to the library every week, twice a week, if you've got a child that's like eating them up, but also encourage reading those books over and over and over again. That's one thing that, that we do. So, um, on my work day, Eric always takes them to the library and Soraya comes home with, um, we sort of have a four book limit because if I didn't seriously, all the library would be at my house and it would all be in Soraya's backpack. So, um, and with her, she'll pick up a, <laughs> she'll pick up a, um, a chapter book just cause she likes the cover of it. And, and, and so, and it won't be age appropriate. And so we have this, this rule that there can only be one of those and everything else has to be, you know, a picture book. And so she'll bring those picture books home and she will go over them over and over and over again. And she not like sort of gravitates towards books that, are like the subjects we're reading. Like we went whale watching um, two weeks ago and then we're reading this book about the seashore and she bring, brought home a bunch of picture books about whales this week. And they were like storybooks. So, and she's like eating up all of the sleepy time sparkle stories about the ocean. So, you know, really learning how to sort of pull all of those things together. Mm -hmm. And that, that means that I have to be in a spot of like, suggesting. I go, you know, this one looks really good. Oh, I know you think you want to take that home, but we're not going to take that home today. Maybe when you're seven, we can take that home, but today we're going to take home this one. Which one would you like? This one or this one? Don't give too many choices. Don't allow things that you're not comfortable with. And uh, remember that you're the mom. Remember that you're in charge of things. Remember that you're the one that's, that's responsible for that. Um, library card and ultimately in the end and sort of um, hold your your ground and, and be firm in it so let me I'm gonna read some more comments here do scale back on what she was reading I think it's too, yeah so you know there are some things I would say if your child is um, under seven and reading um, like gung-ho I would say frog and toad there's a lot of those um, mouse soup um, Franklin little bear um, there's a couple of, there's some Waldorf ones too that would be okay. Um, there's the, the Hay for My Ox one. Those are ones that we actually do at the end of first grade and into second grade anyway. Um, do you find girl, boys and girls learn to read differently? I think temperament plays, like if I look at my five kids, temperament has played a bigger role than, um, than sex. And um, so I think about it, my my daughter that's that's now she's gonna be 16 the day after tomorrow holy crap I don't know what happened <laughs> it's really crazy anyway so she was um, kind of a slower reader but not really slow I mean it, she was in second grade when she finally decoded it but she's also incredibly sanguine so it was a for her it was definitely like 
you got to slow down. <laughs> you know, once we could get her to slow down and, and go through and get through all the letters and get through all the, because it just, it just really was a matter of her like, la, 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 la. She's called her Smurfette for a long time because it was very much like, that's where she lived. Um, Samuel, who is um, 10 and very phlegmatic. And I would say, I, I kind of can't put Harry in, even though he's really phlegmatic. He's my oldest. He read early because he has autism. So he was like, I'm going to do it. Um, him, it was more like a decode. <laughs> um, so Samuel was um, slower but determined. Like he really wanted to, um, it, he really, he... It was slower as in that it like, okay, so it took us a while through first grade. We got through all the letters. He had them down. He was very methodical, but it wasn't until, um, he was in the second grade. Maybe it was somewhere between first and second, something like that. No, it seems like he was in the second grade and he had it in his head that he wanted to read this big star Wars book. And I was like, all right, but buddy, <laughs> we're looking at like, you know, these, um, Jan, cat sat on a mat books and you're wanting to read this. So there's like space that has to happen here. So what has to happen? And so at that point, then he was like, Oh, okay. So I really want to read this book, which he ever, actually never ended up reading, but he read a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and, and he had to, he had to push his, himself to it. So we, we got through all of those, um, those early Waldorf readers. And then we moved on to Hay for My Ox and the Little Bear and all of those other ones. And then, you know, by the end of second grade, he was flying. And um, he's midway through fourth grade now and obviously can read anything. He's a really strong reader. And, um, but I do think that phlegmatics, they are very methodical about it. So um, if you get one that is, um, if you're, you've got a child that's perfectionist and frustrated, sorry, garbage truck again. Seriously? That's why I do my videos at six in the morning, <laughs> usually. So anyways, if you've got ones that are sort of getting perfectionist and, and, and struggling, just get them to slow down. You know, I do a lot of essential oils during school and, and really get that, just get them to slow down and get them to be in a calm space. So my phlegmatic eight-year-old is hard to motivate. Well, I would say, let's go to the library and find something you really want to read. And, or, you know, find a way to, phlegmatics do pretty good with incentives. So if they really want to do something, then they'll do it. Um, what do you think I should do? You started with numbers and then your child started adding and subtracting. You know, math is different. Math is different. So Steiner said math belonged to the gods. And, and I, I happen to really like that really, that feels like a very strong truth to me. And, um, so if they're adding and as long as they're not spending crazy amounts of time computing because I know that can really happen. You know, like, like again, my oldest that's on the spectrum, he could sit in math land all day and, um, he'd be like, look at this cool thing that I, and I'm like, dude, not everybody thinks that way. Um, so I would, um, definitely make sure it's balanced, but it's all right if they're adding and subtracting. Um, you know, it sorting is part of that process that then leads itself to reading eventually. So allowing that sorting process to happen is an okay thing. So my youngest, um, she's five and a half and, um, she's got SPD and she's got some OCD stuff going. So she will sort if, and, and so I have to like, she'll sort for hours. So I have to make sure it's like a appropriate, not frantic thing. And if it's getting too frantic, then I have to start to pull her back from it. We have to do something active. So, um, a lot of kids sort of naturally come to sorting. So just watch it, keep an eye on it. You know, if it's like frantic and not right. So, um, if it doesn't feel right, then you have to do something else. So I'm going to look at the rest of your comment here. Um, adding and subtracting by yourself while she's driving pictures. I think that's okay. I think it's just, I would feel it out. And, um, and also again, don't just don't be so stressed out about that part of it. So many parents like see this as a, an opportunity to rush forward. And so that's when you say to yourself, okay, I'm a homeschooler, but I'm not one of those homeschoolers that pushes forward as fast as, as we can, you know, because there is, there is a whole segment of homeschoolers that, um, they homeschool because they don't think the public school is doing it fast enough. So they homeschool so that their four year old can read. And, and that's not what Waldorf is all about. So I think a, a lot of these, these things that happen sort of between five and seven 
are really going to test whether or not you're really on board with the Waldorf method. <laughs> They're really going to test whether or not you're like okay with it. And so you just have to get really good at deflecting comments. And, um, and I would say things like, you know, he's got the rest of his life to read. He doesn't have the rest of his life to play. So I'm going to let him play for another year. Um, and, and then we're going to worry about reading. And those are the things that I told people. So when you've got then um, this child that's sort of out of the norm, I, I had to be really, I had to be my child's advocate at a, on a regular basis. I had to make sure that Sunday school teachers knew that they weren't reading. In fact, I would, I would do this up until they were reading. I, every year my kids get a new Sunday school teacher. Um, and so I would go and meet that teacher, would introduce myself, if, usually it's somebody I know because we're in the same congregation, but I would say, so I know you've got Sam in your class this year, and I just want to let you know where he's at with reading so that you don't call on him. And I will come back and let you know when he is fluently reading so you can call on him for anything. So right now it would be really great if you'd ask him to do the opening prayer and you'd ask him to help you with the chalkboard. Just please don't ask him to read any scriptures out loud yet. And I would do the same, I did the same thing with all of my kids, with whatever level they were at. I would, I was constantly in contact with their teachers and those teachers really appreciated it because a lot of parents are just like, go to class and, and they're, they're not having that interaction. But the teachers that we had were always appreciative. And when I was teaching those classes, I was super appreciative. I was super appreciative when a parent would come to me and say, it would be really great if you didn't let them have any junk. And I was like the non-junk teacher anyway. I'm like, duh, we're just going to have some cheese and crackers. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I was really always appreciating it. And, and I think that most teachers really um, appreciate that when you are interacting. Uh, another thing came up here recently with, um, so our kids go to karate and they love it. All of them do. And the karate instructor, the guy that owns the dojo, is a really close family friend of ours. He's also a 37-year-old man who's never been married and has no children. So when he's got Soraya's class and, um, and he's telling her, I need you to do 20 jumping jacks. And she looks at him and I shout from across the room, Jerry, she can't count. Oh, okay, Soraya, I'm going to count for you. So, you know, you might have to sort of like educate some of the, the, t the teachers or, um, or he'll do in, in other classes, who knows the capital of, and I'm like, Jerry, he's like, oh yeah, I think I better ask Melissa whether or not these kids probably know this stuff yet because <laughs> he doesn't have any kids. And so we're really close friends and so we can do that, but it's really good if you can get to know the teachers that your kids have so that your kids aren't put in a situation of feeling really silly or, um, you know, and the one time that I didn't say something to a teacher, and it wasn't even a teacher, it was somebody that Eleanor was getting a ride with, um, and it was somebody from church, and somebody well-meaning, but it was somebody she was getting a ride with to some event. Um, she came home and she was like, why don't I know algebra? And she was like, in fifth grade, and I'm like, because uh, you're in fifth grade? <laughs> and she was like really sort of confused and so then I sat down and I said well you know a lot of kids in public school do things this way and my guess is that that kid even though they think they know algebra or they're in a pre-algebra class at, in fifth grade it's not really what they're doing they're not doing much things that are different than what you're doing so you know really sort of helping them understand somebody says my daughter is sanguine will be seven in two weeks and it's not interested in learning do I just go with that um I would be yes I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a worrisome thing, but I would start really working on, um, are you doing first grade with her, Dasha? Dasha? I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I, I, if you're doing first grade with her, then I would really be like, okay, well, we're going to at least have some sort of instruction. Maybe you're starting with painting instruction or drawing instruction. Um, my, my second son would not, would not have anything to do with any of the letters until he was seven. So um, I can remember very clearly, he would listen to the stories and we would draw and we would paint and we would do handwork and we would do music and he loved that. But if I started talking to him about the sounds of letters, he was like, uh-uh, lady, no. So I sort of just let him go, which is kind of amazing because my ex-husband was really kind of weird about that, but just kind of let him go. And then right around the time he was seven, and it may have been right after he was seven, we were, we lived close enough to church that we could walk home. And he turns to my husband and he says, my mom won't teach me how to read. My husband looks at me and he goes, 
And he looks at my, my son, who was his stepson, and said, oh, yes, she will. And we went home and he read like in two days. Because it was all there and he was he had been absorbing it and he had been collecting it. And then he, he took off reading. So I, I wouldn't worry a ton, but I would absolutely make sure that, um, that you're sort of planting those seeds of, of doing learning. Um, you know, you're saying your daughter loves painting, knitting, model, do all of those things. Tell the stories. She needs the fairy tales. Okay, I'm going to go up here a little bit. Um, Katie says, we tell people that we think my six-year-old can read, but we are waiting to formally teach it when it falls into our curriculum. I think that's the perfect thing to say. Perfect thing to say. Um, she usually interjects with, I learned about squares and, <laughs> and diamonds with, oh, wait, 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 go back. Sorry. Got a new phone. And I'm trying to figure all this out. Um, what else? <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's hilarious. So I, I usually, my kids have gotten really good and part of it is because I'm fairly confident. And so I think that depending on where you are in your homeschooling, you know, I tell people often, if you, especially if you were a breastfeeding mom or a home birthing mom, or that was really important to you and you tell all these already alternative things, you wouldn't let somebody like teach, talk into weaning early. So why would this be any different? And so I, you know, I really just sort of, um, my kids have gotten really good at saying, well, I'm not ready for that yet. So next, please. <laughs> and, and if you can really instill that confidence in them, it's super helpful. Super, super helpful. So I'm going to sort of make sure I didn't miss any comments. Um, yeah, Dasha, you're saying just not the academic so much. I would just, like I said, I would do the stories. I would do all the things that you're doing. And then I would bet that in the next little bit, you're going to see it. Or, you know, you might say, gosh, um, or she'll be in a situation where, or somebody is going to talk to her about reading and then she'll be ready. She'll be ready. Like I said, for my son, it was, um, we had the hymn book out at church and we're singing, singing, singing. And, um, my husband sort of does this funny thing. If you don't know the words to the song, um, you can sing peas and corn to the tune instead, like peas and corn every day kind of thing. And, um, which is not entirely reverent, but I sort of step back on that part. So when they get tired of singing that and they actually want to know what's in the hymn book, then that's when my son was like, oh wait, maybe I should learn how to read. I need to know this stuff. Then I don't have to sing peas and corn anymore. You know, and it's sort of, then it builds. And so it's sometimes it takes them being in a situation like that. Um, but I wouldn't stress so much. I would just do, lay the seeds, lay the foundations, do the stories, do all of the other things that you're doing and just keep going. So hopefully I've, I've gotten through what, um, what will help a lot of you with regards to this early thing and, and not being stressed out. If you've got a five year old that comes to you with this long letter that they've written or copy work that they've done, that's normal. They see you doing it all the time. So they, you know, want to emulate what you're doing. So be okay with that. Um, Soraya can write her name, but not by memory. So she has her sister painted something for her with her name on it. So she'll go and sit at her desk and copy what she wrote uh, or what's painted there. So um, some kids have got their names memorized. That's totally okay. I think that wherever you are, be there. But don't push. Don't push and don't um, don't allow others around you to push. You know, one of the things that is really important is that we have stewardship over these little people. And um, in having stewardship over them, we sort of need to really be able to protect the space. So again, if you are really sold on this method of education and this is what you're wanting to do, then stand up for it when you need to and just say, you know what, we're not there yet. And if you're having struggles, maybe your husband is really struggling, um, then I would, I would say, well, will you read what I'm reading? Um, will you listen to some of these videos? Um, show him this video. Send him to our website. Do those sorts of things that, you know, help educate him. Because obviously, um, and not obviously, but a lot of times, um, a no is a request for more information. And 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 maybe, you know, if dad's got a, a nine to five job that he's going to every day and he's um, he's got all these people around him that are asking him all these questions, was your kid reading yet? Is your dad reading Dads do the comparison thing way more than moms do usually. And so, you know, give him a, an opportunity to go, well, no, but my kid's playing the flute really good. How's your kid doing at the flute? You know, or, you know, give him the the tools that he can answer those questions. So um, Bridget asked, what about last names? You know what? My last name is Nielsen. Sam couldn't spell Nielsen until he was in second grade. So <laughs> it's okay. I would just worry about first names. And then again, I really wouldn't worry about it until first grade. And, and unless they're asking, unless there's a situation where, gosh, you gotta like make your kid 
I I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. I would make sure all the teachers know who your child is so that you're, they can write your child's name on there. And I would even say, um, you know, he's not writing yet. Could you please just make sure you write his name on his paper? Um, because remember, writing should come before reading. So it's okay if you're seeing this, like, writing stuff that they're doing. That's good. They're starting to make those connections, even though they don't really know what those letters mean yet. They will start to make those connections between that and reading. It's coming. It's part of that pre-reading skill. So you want them to be writing before reading anyway. So if you've got a child that's been reading, 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 give them the space to do a lot of drawing, a lot of drawing. Um, a lot of painting, a lot of modeling, a lot of space to sort of bring all of those things together, head, heart, hands, and and really be able to then, um, you know, be on that path for healthy reading and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of movement, lots of movement. And on that note, I'm going to go upstairs, eat my breakfast, and go on a walk. So, hope you all have a great day. Bye now. Mm -hmm.